Hello everybody, welcome to today's webinar. We are glad that you were able to join us today. I just wanted to go over some housekeeping items before we start our session today. You may have noticed that you entered today's presentation in audio silent mode. This means that you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. Therefore, if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please enter them into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your toolbar, and the questions will be submitted to our speakers. We will have around 10 minutes at the end of the presentation today to address any of your questions. Now, I shall hand over to our speakers, Amit and David, who have a great webcast lined up for you today. Thank you very much, Leanne. Appreciate the opportunity to have a conversation with everyone. Much, My name is Dave. Yeah. David Allen with Apogee. Uh, I work on digital strategy with Apogee as a global architect, working with some of our largest customers and our strategic partners on delivering end-to-end -end solutions, uh, both in financial services and outside of financial services. Good, mo uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Amit Malik. Um, I work in the digital business with an Accenture uh, looking after financial services customers in the UK, uh, especially folks focusing around the technology implications of uh, things like PSD2, open banking, open APIs, etc. Excellent. Right. So, Lian, should we proceed on to the presentation now? Absolutely. So shall we start from slide four then? Right. Uh, I hope everybody is able to see the slides. Uh, if I if I go back into a bit of history around you know what's what's happening with with banking, especially around payments. Uh, the original PSD was formed around 2007. Uh, it was an initiative to create a single market for payments within the European Union. Uh, it came out with a whole lot of you know, guidelines, processes, and rules around how uh, payments could happen you know, within, within the European Union. So, and, and a lot of banks and financial organizations and other institutions are still working on that. And I, I hear that you know the full implementation of you know PSD is you know still ongoing. Uh, having having said that, the regulator decided to come up with a new regulation uh, called PSD2 Payment System Directive 2 which was intended to cast the net wider by bringing in a whole host of additional players uh, into the payments ecosystem uh, which include people like uh, which include operators of e-commerce marketplaces operators of gift cards uh, bill payment service providers providers who provide account access service uh, and 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 even digital wallets uh, the intention behind this is to create a level playing field across the bigger and the smaller players and and promote innovation and foster competition within within the within the payment space so without without trying to not delve too much deeper into the regulation let me quickly highlight uh, some of the key aspects of this regulation, and especially try to focus on uh, the technical implementation, the technical uh, technical implementation of you know of PSD2. Uh, one is number one is PSD2 has resulted in you know as I said, casted the net wider. It has brought in a whole range of you know additional pay players. Who will have to get certified as you know payment institutions and who have you know come under regulation now. Uh, the next important uh, change in the regulation is introduction of you know what what the regulator calls as payment initiation service provider. These are players or third parties who would be able to initiate a payment 
uh, on a customer's behalf and make and help facilitate a direct transaction between a customer's bank account or the payer's bank account to, to a payee bank account, or which may be a merchant bank account. Then there is regulation around people who act as you know, aggregators of you know, payment, payment transactions or aggregators of any sort of you know, account, financial account-related transactions. Uh, and, and, and I'll cover you know, more examples of you know, this as we go through. Uh, then there are things around security and authentication in terms of you know, identifying how to make you know, all of these new type of transactions very secure and how to create, make the customer comfortable that, that their transactions are secure, it's not prone to fraud, and that their liabilities are fairly limited uh, in case you know, something goes wrong. So that, that in a broad context is what PSD2 is trying to achieve. Uh, what we are trying to focus today is is around you know the technical implement impact of PSD2, especially around use of open APIs to you know facilitate PSD2. So, Leon, can we move to the next slide, please? Right. So, so, so. <sighs> At the core of PSD2, there are, there are two types of, I guess, two categories of payment transactions discussed. One is, you know, what I call as, call as AISP, which is, uh, which is Account Information Service Provider, which is all about, you know, aggregation of financial accounts uh, across multiple banks and financial organizations. And the other is PISP, which is, uh, payment initiation service provider, which is all about providing third-party access uh, to initiate payment transactions from one bank account to another, uh, bypassing existing, you know, payment processes like, you know, credit card networks or, or a Visa or MasterCard network, for example. Uh, the code, all of these propositions are, you know, centered around one thing that a third party, which is defined as a third-party provider, will be able to directly and securely and seamlessly access a bank account. And, and this is where you know, APIs you know, start becoming relevant because in today's digital world, APIs are the necessary digital glue to, to make this type of connection happen uh, from an external third party uh, into a bank or a financial institution. And, and, and and PSD2 is, you know, one step which the regulator is taking to make all of this to, all of this happen. But the important thing to note here is that, you know, it doesn't end with PSD2. While PSD2 will come up with its own set of, you know, interesting and innovative use cases, uh, I think the bigger bigger story about banks is, you know, all about, you know, how the bank gets opened up in an API world. And how things like you know open banking come into place, which extend the scope of these type of activities, you know, beyond payments. And we are looking at you know ability to initiate and initiate loans, mortgages, and other type of you know financial products from outside outside the institutions of the banks of of the bank today. Again, the reason why banks are interested and will be interested in you know doing all of these things is multi multiple. Uh, there are the obvious reasons of being a part of an ecosystem when you engage with third party players. Uh, they are a banks are able to use these type of technologies to improve the improve and expand their distribution network. Uh, they are able to in they are able to you know, innovate at pace because a uh, lot of the innovation or uh, over-the-top services which these type of initiatives bring in are actually created by the third party. So, so the bank, in exclusive partnership with a third party provider, can quickly, rapidly, and in an agile way release new types of offerings and you know, services to the market, which they would, would have not been able to do so on their own. More, more, more interestingly, these provide you know, new revenue streams for the banks because there is ample scope to you know, monetize around these services. 
banks should start looking at <laughs> looking at APIs, especially to an open banking APIs, not as technology technology solutions, but as business products. And they should start, you know, managing these as business products because each API which a bank creates, which it exposes to third party, has or has or can have a potential monetization angle to it. And there could be a revenue share model or, or <laughs> paper use model created with third parties uh, to, to make money. And and the biggest thing, you know, which is driving the adoption, which I'm sure all of you are aware of, are, are really two initiatives, uh, open banking uh, and, and PSD2, which are fairly, you know, regulatory in nature, and uh, banks will have to, you know, do something about these things over the next two years. Let us have a look at, you know, a few examples of what other banks are doing in this space. So if we move over to the next slide, please. There, there are, in, are quite a few examples here uh, about what other banks are doing. <laughs> For example, Credit Agricole was one of the first banks in Europe to launch a set of open APIs. So their model was to expose a set of APIs and create a platform where third-party developers and innovators are able to build apps based around the bank's core services uh, and 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 this has been you know quite fruitful and interesting for them uh if i put a small statistic in there for great agricole to you know build their first app it took them more than a year once they opened up their platform in 2013 exposed a set of core banking processes and data third party innovators and developers have actually built 84 apps in the last 2 years uh for great agricole uh, yeah, some of them are interesting. Some of them are not so interesting, in my opinion. But but the speed of innovation has you know increased you know tenfold. The access to digital ecosystem has you know gone up multifold, which is which is the important message. It was all about great agricole, you know, creating the ability to connect to the di digital world through through APIs. Uh, <clears throat> one of the most most exciting examples of a digital bank which has embraced the use of APIs is, is Fedor Bank in Germany. Uh, this bank is a pure digital bank, but as against, apart from you know, traditional products, it has also leveraged APIs to significantly imp, uh, introduce new products, which, which was not there in the banking space previously. You know, things like peer-to-peer -peer lending, peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments, very sophisticated, you know, Portfolio management tools, personal finance management tools have been introduced by the by Fedor Bank along with their partners through through use of APIs. Uh, <clears throat> closer closer back into UK, uh, RBS is one of the banks which has uh, which has been which has been on the forefront of the open API revolution, and uh, the global transaction services business in the RBS is collaborating with a lot of fintech organizations to see how they could provide innovation uh, on top of their core services uh, through API sharing. Uh, there are multiple you know, other examples in place, but what is common across all of these examples is that you know, all of these banks have been able to you know, expose their core data and core processes through APIs. And they are able to improve, improve, increase, and uh, the, the number of products, offerings, and services they provide to their customers through through API technology. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? Right. So. Jumping back again into into PSD2 era, uh, I thought it would be worthwhile for us to look at uh, look at you know some of the taxonomy which is used in the PSD2 space because there are a lot of there's a lot of you know jargon around the space. But I think I thought there were really key six terms which can help us to you know, navigate the PSD2 space. Uh, the first is an account service payment service provider which is called as a ASPSP. 
this is this is the traditional financial organization as defined in the PSD2 space. So most banks, credit card companies, payment institutions, or anywhere where a customer holds an account which shows you know financial transaction data falls under falls under this category. So so these are the people who will be asked to expose APIs in the PSD2 era. Then there, are, then there are organizations which are called as AISPs, Account Information Service Provider. These are aggregators of data in the PSD2 era. So these will aggregate data from multiple ASPSPs and, 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 and provide you know, value-added information, analytics, recommendations to end customers. Then there are PISPs, which are the payment providers. These are people who will help to transact, initiate transactions from one uh, ASPSP account or one bank account to another bank account. Then, then, then there are the payment service providers, you know, which, 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 is, which is a broader category, which covers you know, all of these first three categories. And then there is the payment service user, which is, and, and there are two parts to this. So there is the individual user uh, of an a AISP or a PISP account who can help to do the transaction. Uh, or who wants to initiate the transaction, and then there is obviously the merchant who is the pay or the recipient of you know these type of transactions, and then there are APIs, which are which is the digital glue which is you know connecting you know all of these together. So if we if we, if, we, if we move ahead and you know look at you know some of the use cases which are getting discussed, uh, especially around AISPs and PISPs. So if we can move to the next slide, please. There are two main interaction models for the post PSD2 era. One is around PISPs, and you know, one is one is around AISPs. And I, I think I've described this a bit before, but it's really today a transaction happens when a customer goes to a merchant's website uh, and they decide to do a purchase. They are presented with mainly two options, you know, pay with a credit card or a debit card, which is a card-related transaction, or, or pay through uh, an online digital payment provider like, like PayPal, or pay through some digital wallet, you know, digital wallet, you know, things like, you know, Google Wallet, et cetera, in the U.S. Uh, tomorrow, there will be a third option available where the user will have the option to choose their own PISP who will be integrated to their bank and they will be able to instruct the PISP in a very secure way to, to, to use an API, communicate with the customer's bank and, and initiate a payment transaction directly from the customer's bank to the merchant or the pays bank. And, and all of these transactions, which will require multiple API calls, uh, can, can be done very securely and safely, and that's the intention of PSD2. Uh, similarly, in an in a aggregation scenario, which I call as the AISP scenario, we have an opportunity where customers today need to you know, go and log in individually into their individual bank accounts to see uh, how much you know, funds they hold, what is their net worth. But there will be an option tomorrow uh, to do it you know, very safely and securely using AISP type of services. Now, these type of services are, are not new. These exist in certain countries already. Uh, for example, uh, there is a company called Trustly in, in the Nordics who have been doing this for quite some time, and they have got some uh, interesting demonstrations of their product on their website or YouTube. Uh, you could look at, you know, Trustly, T-R-U-S-T-L-Y. Uh, they are an example of a PISP or a payment initiation service provider, and we should be, you know, seeing these type of services very soon in multiple countries across Europe. Similarly, if you look at, you know, account aggregation services, uh, there are companies, you know, today who provide account aggregation services. For example, Mint.com uh, in the U.S. or MoneyDashboard.com Money in the U.K. 
uh, these companies still use very traditional technology, including screen scraping, uh, to 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 aggregate a lot of information across multiple bank accounts and you know, show a consolidated dashboard of your financial holdings. Uh, in a AISP world, you know all of these can be you know, done much more securely using APIs, uh, and and these and you will be able to see a consolidated view of your financials uh, through through a single web or a mobile device view. So, so I talked about if so. Next slide, please. Uh, I talked about a few base use cases, both for AISPs and PISPs, but. I think I think the innovation which can be created on top of these opportunities are where the real opportunities for the banks, because the regulator will ask the banks to provide support for these base use cases, payment initiation and account aggregation. But what you can do on top of that is where you know things start you know becoming very interesting and innovative. So, for example, you know I talked about the example of you know how you are able to use. Uh, a PISP to do a transaction from one bank account to another, uh, but think think of a scenario where where at the point of purchase, if you're purchasing a high value item, is the bank able to use the same API communication channel to actually actually push a real time attractive loan offer to the customer and actually do a real time loan? Uh, uh, to the customer at, at the point of sale. You know, that's where it starts, you know, getting interest, interesting and attractive for banks because they suddenly see a new fantastic channel to, you know, push through offers which are more contextual, more relevant. Uh, similarly, in, in the account aggregation scenario, uh, I think, I think what will happen is, you know, a lot of, you know, sophisticated analytics will start, you know, developing on top of the traditional account aggregation scenario where people will be able to, you know, provide you uh, advice, recommendations, uh, suggestions around how to, you know, better uh, do cash balancing, money management, provide you with uh, alerts uh, around, you know, uh, around around the state of affairs of of your personal personal finances, and, and and give you examples like you know if you if you do these payments you'll run out of money on X Y Z date in two months time etc cetera, etc. Cetera. What will also become interesting in in that space is uh, they will also they will also have a view of you know what are your regular outgoing payments. So for example, once you have account aggregation, you will see that you actually pay for you actually pay so much for utilities, and 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 this is the amount you pay monthly on a direct debit. Uh, I, I think there will be an opportunity for these players to you know provide recommendations or you know alternative suggestions around that, which is all around which is a story around, around account switching. So so these players will be able to you know provide recommendations that uh, you currently buy electricity for. 80 pounds a month from this and this provider, but we have looked at multiple other providers uh, in in your region, and and we have realized that you know we could switch you to a new provider for uh, 10 pounds less or 15 pounds less a month. So more and more interesting scenarios will come out where people will be people or providers will be able to you know suggest you alternatives for better financial financial management, better money management, etc. So, so I will I will take a pause here, and 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 try to reflect back on what we discussed. So we really talked about PSD two, which I think <clears throat> is is a first step towards open banking. Uh, most banks will take take one of these two routes, uh, either either start you know opening up their APIs. You know, through the payment route, which is the AISP and the PISP route, or or they will probably take an open banking route and you know come back into PSD2. But both necessarily mean that you will have to start thinking about how to expose APIs. <clears throat> so if I move on to the next slide, so what do you what do you as an organization need to do to to deliver an API capability which is scalable and sustainable? What are the key components that need to be there in an API program? 
I think API programs mean <laughs> mean a whole lot of change in terms of you know way you operate today. So there is a huge you know governance change management, program management implication around how you run API programs. Then there, is, then there are implications around what is, what, what is your API strategy and you know, how do you decide which APIs to you know, build first and you know, which to build later? How do you map use cases to APIs? How do you decide how to prioritize APIs? So these are, these are important uh, and, 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 and these, these needs need to also be considered then there is a question, big question around, you know, what architecture? What's my physical architecture? What's my reference architecture? What's my logical architecture? What standards and guidelines will I follow? Uh, what sort of API management tools should I consider? Uh, because in, in the API world, the use of API management tools or API gateway tools is very important. They really simplify the management of APIs, and, and they are the natural home for APIs within your technology architecture today. Then there is a story about you know, what sort of development, operate, DevOps processes, dev processes, and production processes do you need to create? What sort of you know, design patterns, shared codes, security frameworks do you need to create within your organization? And how do you create a factory which can churn out a certain number of you know APIs a month because uh, I, I think that you know banks will need to you know treat APIs like business products and you know keep on you know churning a certain number of you know newer APIs every month which will address you know newer which will address and support either existing business lines or you know create completely open new business lines for them. Uh, I, I talked a few things about you know the internal things which a bank needs to do, and and this is what I call as API exposure side. While it is important to you know do API exposure, it is also equally important to figure out how to ensure API com consumption. How do you how do you create the ecosystem? Who do you need to partner with? What sort of you know commercial models can you agree with 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 them? Uh, do remember that you know most of these ecosystem partners which banks will go along will be you know much smaller organizations this, these will be you know third party developers uh, innovators and, and fintechs and and it is important to you know create the right sort of engagement framework and figure out you know how do you make sure that you know you are marketing your apis in the right way uh, fintechs and you know consuming that in the right way you are able to measure how much APIs particular partners are consuming and you know agree on a agree on the right monetization model around that so all of these you know become significantly important and and then then you know then then we come to the traditional you know run phase of it how do you, you know keep on you know main, maintaining ongoing services uh, around service delivery uh, service support and and in fact you know API optimization which is which is the most most important space how do you make sure that you have the right analytics and information coming out of your APIs, which will help help you to optimize their performance, optimize their features, optimize their capabilities, etc. So, so these are the top six things which we think are very important for organizations to consider when they start their API journey. Uh, I will pause for a moment and hand over to David now. Amit, thank you. Uh, excellent job giving us a lot of the, the what and the why. Um, we see PSD2 as just the latest disruption to hit financial services as an industry. It's significant, right? It's regulatory driven. It's, it's a, a, a business imperative to satisfy the requirements. We recognize there are many other disruptors in the industry as well, whether it's from uh, new forms of, of, of interaction with consumers, whether it's cryptocurrencies, uh, many, many different pressures on organizations to, to really bring a greater pace of innovation into the four walls of, of the institution. And, and I'm going to speak specifically about the Apogee view on infrastructure components, operational components, the, really the, the entire scope of the delivery of this type of innovation to the institution. Um, to us, the, the, whatever solution you have for, for meeting these challenges, you need to follow into some, some big 
tenets, if you will. First, it, it, there must be this notion of, of the best security models possible, uh, not only secure, but also some flexibility to adapt to a variety of use cases, a variety of security models. In terms of, of meeting the needs for the pace of innovation, there has to be simplicity for the actual implementation team, uh, configuration code, deploy, all of the various activities. We talked about DevOps in prior slides. All of that really has to be in a model where it, it, it's simplified and, and it is exposed to uh, the appropriate people at the appropriate time. Scale, uh, our product, uh, speaking specifically to Apogee, scales uh, phenomenally well horizontally, uh, whether it's on-prem or on cloud. We have multiple solutions uh, for our customers uh, to meet their needs for scale. That is, in the end, uh, as, as the institutions begin to think about how to build this, and even thinking about solutions that provide scale. A lot of what we've done in the past, whether it be screen scraping, point-to-point -point integrations, significant issues around how to scale that kind of infrastructure. Because in the end, this is mission critical infrastructure. My, my conversation will be mostly about how Apogee satisfies these requirements. But even if you're on a path to building your own infrastructure, if you've gone with a competing product, to us, these are the, the core tenets for success. Uh, if your infrastructure can't meet these base requirements, uh, you're starting in a, a, a point of a disadvantage uh, relative to your competitors and, and are at great risk. Having said that, let's talk a little bit about then what the um, API management platform looks like for us. And it's a full life cycle uh, problem in that regard. It, it, not only do we need to be thinking about, as technologists delivering solutions, the, the, the design, if you will, of what an API actually looks like. What does the exposure surface look like? What are the critical uh, resources that are made available? Uh, how are those accessed? Obviously, that's incredibly important. But, but also we need to have within this ecosystem of product or products uh, a notion of, of the development life cycle. We, we, the, the paradigm of all within our four walls is obviously changing fairly quickly. And when we say develop, what we mean is more than just your internal development team. How do you engage? How do you work with? How do you satisfy the needs of external developers is just as important. Um, within our infrastructure, we have a very flexible development platform uh, that includes the polyglot. Uh, we support Python, we support Node.js, JavaScript, Java. Uh, we have a library of ready-to-use out-of-the-box policies that are about acceleration, uh, the delivery of value. Um, when you think about that development, doing so within a, a predictable framework uh, is, is critically important, and there's some great accelerators that, that the Apogee product specifically brings to the table. As you develop your own APIs, that kind of reuse patterns of reuse are critically important as well. Security, publishing, how do I move through the various stages of, of uh, the SDLC that my organization uses? Do I have the supporting technology in place uh, to facilitate efficient workflows? critically important. Obviously, scale, uh, especially for, for our financial services customers who are global in nature, the ability to have uh, a, a global uh, deployment platform, whether it's on-premises across multiple DCs, geo-distributed around the world, whether they're using our on-cloud platform, uh, similar type requirements. Monitoring, we talked a bit about this whole notion of optimization of the experience. The ability not only to monitor the performance aspects, but also the consumption aspects through an analytics platform. Uh, whether you're going with an Apogee solution where we've got the whole Insights product to help inform not just the monitoring and ops team, but also the API product owners in, in terms of the uptake uh, of the API solution. Uh, critically important and, and something that oftentimes gets overlooked 
if we're purely thinking of this in terms of technical delivery. And then monetization, um, whether it's through for API call, whether it's, it's through a subscription type program, multiple ways to turn on a, a profit, if you will, profit center with your APIs, or at least a cost recovery uh, program with, with APIs. But as you build your platform, a critical component is how will we begin to capture uh, revenue through APIs. Uh, super important as well. So how, how are and what are some of the things, the use cases that we're satisfied today with the platform? Uh, it really is this, this notion of the open banking uh, paradigm. And a lot of this is, is currently focused around payments and, and, and payment use cases, um, but there are a number of other potential areas of engagement where we are in early stages with many different customers. And, and that's one of the things we want to say. PSD2 as a driver of, of change and disruption in organizations is just one of many pressures. Um, and while you may be able to say we can satisfy a PSD2 in the near term by adapting what we already have in place, perhaps, or by leveraging some legacy technology, what I think this really represents is an opportunity for organizations to, to on the backs of, if you will, a regulatory mandate, put in place the components, not just from a technology, but from a process, from a, from a business perspective, um, to become much more nimble and be able to deal more proactively with the disruptions that are coming our way. And, and those may be from you know, innovations around wealth management and, and the notion of robo-advisors for wealth management, uh, regulatory issues with PSD2, uh, opening up uh, some of the, the more traditionally closed-in processes around things like loans and deposit management and the like. All of these are excellent opportunities. And once you begin to capture the interaction with the end user through the digital channel, it's these adjacencies uh, are, are a more natural way to acquire greater mind share with that customer, greater wallet share with that customer. And so as we look at where we're going with customers, it's not just blockchain and, and distributed ledger. It's not just PSD2. We're really encouraging customers to take a more holistic view, uh, our clients to take a more holistic view of how they're interacting both within their ecosystem and with their consumers, with their, their customers, their end customers. It's not just a, a customer, though, to institution relationship that you're building. You can use the word ecosystem. And, and that, to us, is critically critically important, that external developer community, the, the, the FinTech ecosystems, the, the if you will, the, the, the other financial institutions, uh, the opportunity to collaborate, and actually I would say the, the by necessity, uh, the mandate uh, just from a business perspective to collaborate has never been greater. And, and implementing a platform, a, a, a rather than one-offs and point-to-points and and leveraging this legacy technology, if you think of a more platform-centric approach to meeting these requirements, uh, I think it becomes pretty obvious that you're beginning to enable a capability within your institution that's just absolutely mandatory for not only growth, but in some cases even survival. Uh, we've seen that in other industries. We've seen that the disruption that's occurred in the telecommunications space, in the, the entertainment space, uh, how we now are delivering uh, entertainment content uh, to consumers, uh, complete disruption. That model of disruption, of complete sea change in how industries operate, is absolutely heading uh, every day more and more toward financial services. So to us, that, that thinking of it not just in terms of the engagement <coughs> with consumers or just with, with, uh, with uh, other uh, financial institutions, thinking of it more as creating the ecosystem to thrive within uh, and, and building a platform, implementing a platform that enables that is, is critically important. So uh, all of this to us is an obvious case where API-driven 
architectures are super uh, valuable, are, are extremely valuable. It, it really is about agility. It's about, while you could create those one-to-one interactions, one-to-one point-to-point integration, uh, standardizing on a common set of APIs phenomenally improves your agility, your speed to market. And in some ways, these things are fairly obvious, but we still see a lot of customers, a lot of uh, financial services firms approaching these problems with a, a kind of legacy mindset, and that simply will not work. Uh, the API-based architecture also has the capacity to scale, not just in terms of performance of the underlying infrastructure, but in terms of number of partners that can be served. Uh, at the same time, you, 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 we are seeing the emergence of an entirely new breed of, of business in this space that is entirely API-driven. Uh, so to us, the interoperability of APIs, the strategic mindset change that occurs when you begin to think of opening yourself up uh, as a collaborator, as as a ecosystem partner, uh, begins to make the the strategic shift for the entire business. <coughs> so, how, how do we? What do you need component wise to create those ecosystems? You know, what what are the the critical elements? Um, for us, it's it's a it's a combination of of many different attributes, and, and I've talked a little bit about what the Apogee stack looks like. There there is this whole notion of the the API itself, uh, the the exposure of information, kind of the plumbing that runs underneath of it, underneath uh, the implementation, and that that's a core component of our stack. On top of that, there's this developer services layer. How do I publish information in a consumable way? What are the self-service functions for the ecosystem that I can provide so it's not creating a, a burden upon my organization to support every new developer's day on board? How do I enable things like monetization of APIs in a more automated fashion? Uh, that's our developer services tier. And then the whole view of not just transactional data, but, but even more advanced analytics uh, around things like uh, the, the entire life cycle uh, of the interactions across multiple flows. So we have this core, on the left-hand side of this slide, this edge infrastructure complemented by the right side of the insights that we want to gain on the actual interactions that are occurring. This to us is the the view from an architecture perspective, the, the, the holy grail, if you will, of what will drive success uh, in, in organizations today. <coughs> so as Apogee is beginning to to get become a deeper uh, deeper relationship within financial services become more of a critical component in, in our financial services customers, there's this emerging payments platform uh, coming together for us. Uh, and, and, and really, this is about, as I said, that you begin to think beyond just the PSC2 use case. What can we begin to do once we start these more digital interactions with customers? What are some of the adjacencies, right? So if we're interacting with a customer on a particular payment transaction, is there a opportunity to begin to cross market to that consumer? Can we begin to talk to that customer about their loyalty programs? Can we, can we begin to introduce ways to pay uh, differently? Um, so if your loyalty program includes things like, like points or, or credit, can we begin to encourage users to create greater stickiness with our consumers by having them pay with points uh, as we go? These are the, the things that begin to become possible as you implement an overarching API program as you build this robust infrastructure, the fact that, that, that you can not only see those interactions, but begin to extend and enhance those interactions using the, the, a platform that really allows you to achieve what we call C-suite IP. And, and that's kind of the core underlying message. In, in, in so many infrastructures, so many organizations, you do have a fairly uh, slow evolving line of business system, a, a, an SDLC that's appropriate to those line of business systems, which is completely out of phase with what 
you want to do on the digital side, on the edge where you're interacting more uh, frequently at a more rapid pace, uh, where you're, you're perhaps testing innovation, uh, you're failing fast with, with ideas on the digital side. And having a platform like Apogee um, as, as a point of agility, as, as a, a component where you can very quickly assemble integration, where you can onboard developers quickly, you can test an idea, you can innovate, you can iterate, you can begin to very quickly test out these ideas is absolutely crucial. Without something like Apogee in place, the disruption to those line of business systems is such that most, most companies stall and fail. Uh, so again, as we put these components in place, our ability to, to begin to talk to merchants, to talk to uh, other partners, uh, to be able to directly interact with consumers, uh, it absolutely increases. So Accenture and Apogee, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a great relationship. Um, we, we have delivered on over 80 plus engagements across a wide range of, wide range of industries. Uh, Accenture is not just a, a delivery partner. They are a, a partner across the board with us. Amit, would you like to speak a little bit to that relationship? Sure. So Accenture, Accenture started, you know, looking at, you know, APIs and, and, and the possibility which the world of APIs, you know, opened up quite a few years ago. And uh, and we, we, we had a look at, you know, multiple organizations, uh, but, you know, our preferred choice of, you know, partner <laughs> in, in this space is Apigee, you know, due, due to multiple reasons. Uh, including, you know, Apigee, you know, having a strong heritage uh, around uh, API management, uh, API gateway, and API gateway solutions, and Accenture has uh, is also a stakeholder with an Apigee in Apigee. So, so we believe strongly in Apigee as you know one of the best solutions out there, and and it's it's our preferred choice uh, of uh, of for for an API management tool. Excellent. I think at this point, Leanne, we can open it up to questions. Yes, we can. Um, just to remind everybody, if you can use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your um, On24 screen um, and we'll submit the questions to the speakers. We do have, we've had quite a few questions that have come in throughout the presentation. Um, so I'll start with, with these. There's quite a few in here for you, Amit, um, around PSD2. So I'll start with, with the first question, and it's it's a sort of three three questions within in one. So um, the first question is, I like the interaction models presented before and after PSD2, but I still don't understand what exact uh, problems PSD2 is addressing. Why would PSD2 bother about exposing customer data to PSIPs? Where is the use case? So, so that's our first so I think I think I think we need to understand you know what why was you know PSD2 created uh, the regulator realized that there is a whole host of you know players out there in the market who are providing you know financial services who are not under the or, or who are on the fringes of you know providing financial services but who are not under the purview of regulator so one of the aim was to you know bring this you know newer digital age financial services uh, players under the purview of regulation. What also this gives this means for the end customer is that the end customer is able to look at you know much more tradition, much more uh, innovative and agile services which a traditional bank is not able to provide. Which which essentially means that they have just opened up the market. To a wider range of players to this, and you know, are actually you know fostering uh, better competition among uh, in, in the market, and actually asking the banks to wake up and you know start innovating and reacting reacting equivalently uh, to to all of to to this space of you know digital innovation. And most importantly, importantly, it's 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 also important. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, 
so so in so innovation innovation is key giving the customer more transparent information and and direct access to their information is key uh, uh, and also also key is uh, opening up the market for for competition because right now this space only the big players are able to you know uh, are are able to you know make it make any significant play to the market it's very difficult for you know smaller to come into the market and you know make a significant dent uh, so it's opening up to competition it's providing more innovation and you know providing and if, and providing information to customers in a more transparent and efficient way and you know making it easier for them as a whole so so those are really the things you know which psd hope which you know regulator hopes to achieve in the post psd2 era so okay. i don't know if, if that answers that particular question okay the second question is is screen scraping a problem even for a client side aggregator like eWise? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to this one. Screen scraping has had a place, you know, in, in the evolution of, of of these types of integrations. There, there are a couple of issues that, that I have experienced personally with with screen scraping based infrastructures. First, is it really truly is a point to point solution? The, the screen scraping typically is a interaction and and data model problem that needs to be configured separately for each integration. And so as such, it doesn't scale particularly well. And in addition, you have the problem of, of a security context, which is dependent more upon a presentation type view as opposed to a systems to systems view, which means that you're oftentimes going to, to it's going to take multiple interactions to achieve a single transaction, or you're simply not going to get to a significant portion of data that, that you actually would be more properly consuming than a true purpose-built API. So, so to us, screen scraping is a, a fallback position when it's simply impossible. But API-based interactions are significantly more feature-rich, secure, uh, and performant. Yeah. Thanks, David. OK, next question. If Mint.com is currently in a position to retrieve bank account transactions, et cetera, from banks, does it mean PSD2 is already satisfied by most of the banks in the world currently? So, yes, yes and no. Yes and no. So, so yes, you know, Mint.com, you know, with the banks with which it is interacting, uh, is subscribing to a PSD2 model. However, I think what the regulator wants to do with PSD2 is, you know, standardize that interaction model. I don't think, you know, using, you know, traditional technologies, you know, for account aggregation, uh, there are any particular standards. I believe there, there is a lot of screen scraping, point-to-point -point integration involved there. Uh, it's, it's not a replicable, scalable, secure model. So, uh, from a use case perspective, you know, they are, yes, you know, they comply to one of the PSD2 standards, but I think, you know, when it comes to the technical specifications, uh, the banks will, you know, not comply to PSD2 standards because the regulator wants things to be done in a certain way, uh, which will be a part of, you know, the PSD2 standards and specifications. Okay, thank you. We had, we had a couple of questions similar to that, so I think that's answered some other, other questions that we've had. So the next question is, there is a lot of discussion around banks showing interest in blockchains. Does PSD2 address stroke accept it as a strong enough form of a digital transaction? So there is no, no, no explicit mention of, you know, use of, you know, blockchain type of technology under, under the PSD2 guidelines. But, but do bear in mind that the PSD2 guidelines, which uh, European Banking Authority is going to release somewhere around uh, February uh, are, are not yet finalized. I haven't, you know, individually seen any particular reference to, you know, blockchains, you know, as of now. But that does not mean that, you know, there won't be any amendments into the regulation in future to 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 include blockchains because I strongly believe that, you know, there is a place, strong strong place for coexistence of both APIs and blockchains. Okay, thank you. Uh, David, this is probably the next question one for you to answer. 
So it's what key features of the Apogee platform insulate from legacy banking systems? Yep, excellent, excellent question. And it's really one of the key value props, I think, for an Apogee-like solution. But first and foremost, the, the, the connector infrastructure, if you think of it in terms of the restful exposure, uh, perhaps a quickly evolving or an expanding inventory of resources, through an Apigee or Apigee-like infrastructure connecting to your traditional web services infrastructure, the Apigee tier allows you to do a certain amount of choreography, orchestration even. Um, it certainly allows you to insulate, a great word. The changes in the exposure tier uh, can be adapted from a, a mix of resources in the line of business tier, so our target systems. Um, so as well, as target systems evolve and change, you have the similar opportunity to preserve functionality in the API exposure tier. So if you think of it as that, that man in the middle, in this case it's, it's, that's a good thing, um, that person in the middle that can do the translation and orchestration, uh, the aggregation, the mashing up of content from multiple different line of business legacy systems, uh, it, 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 it's, it's a, uh, tier in which, because of the tooling, because of the, the uh, available features, you can very quickly iterate around and, and abstract out some of those changes or some of those complexities uh, in the target system itself. It, it's probably worth a, a walk through some of our, our webinar, webinar content around uh, service orchestration and the like. would be happy to provide some pointers to that after this, this meeting as well. Thanks, David. There's another Apogee-specific question as well. Um, most of the banking, finance, and insurance companies in the EU are going for on-premise options. How does Apogee perform in this stack against its competitors? Yeah, it, it, it is a full-featured representation of our functionality available in the cloud. It's available on-premises. Um, what, what, what you have the advantage of uh, our operational infrastructure when you're on cloud, but absolutely understand whether it's from security, uh, performance, or just a pure preference for on-prem. Um, the full suite of Apigee functionality is available on-prem as it's expressed on cloud. So there's no real differentiation between the product features. Relative to the competition, we do have some, there are some folks in our space uh, who offer more of a, a hybrid solution where there are mandatory elements in, in cloud, there is none of that with the Apigee solution. You can run entirely on-premises. Okay, and I think we've got time for one more question. Um, so the last question is, peer-to-peer -peer lending stroke transfers being looked into by traditional banks today? If so, do you see them using FinTech APIs to achieve this? That's an interesting one. And then I would take your, your opinion on this. I think this is more opinion-based. Um, I guess I would have to look at what's in it for the traditional banks in, in that scenario, in the peer-to-peer. -peer. Okay. We, we have the, um, the question. We can follow that one up separately after the um, webcast and get more into the, to this specific use case for that. Okay, so that um, concludes the questions for the webinar today. Thanks, everybody, um, for all of your questions. We haven't had time to answer all of them, so I'll make sure that our speakers follow up. Um, there was one or two that we, we didn't have time to answer, so we'll make sure that those get um, followed up after this session. Um, so I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank our speakers, Amit and David, today for a really informative presentation. Um, we have recorded today's webcast and have recording uh, shall be available on the apogee.com website over the next few days. Um, so with that, thanks everybody for your time in attending the webcast today. Um, and that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you. Thank you all.